Let's keep playing until Brian gets it. Yeah. Hey, good morning, family. Good morning. I'm glad to see you here. Want to uh, do a couple things. First of all, make sure that you uh, do your uh, little card there, connection, so that uh, we know you're here. Thank you. Oh, there it goes. And also, if you have prayer requests or praises, please put those down on the card so that uh, we can know what's, what's going on. Hopefully you got a bulletin. Uh, there's a couple of things on there that have been postponed in the current uh, situation. Uh, we're going to try to uh, do as best that we can. Uh, one of the key is that God doesn't want us to live in a fear, but he does want us to be prudent. And we're trying to be prudent. So uh, do take a look at that. Uh, we still have on the schedule at this point in time the men's breakfast coming up on March 28th. And also really important is the church work party to uh, get the, uh, the building and the grounds prepared for the um, Easter service that uh, we're planning to have. Now, one of the key things that uh, we're trying to do in, in light of uh, the present situation is that, yeah, if you need a sneeze, tissue, elbow, whatever, try to have a little bit of the social distancing. It's not that we don't like you. It's that we just are trying to make sure that in this day and age, if you're out, you could be exposed. You could be a carrier without knowing it. We just don't want to, to transmit it here, if at all possible. Uh, we're going to also have a little bit of different thing uh, for your tithes and your offerings. We have uh, baskets at the back uh, anytime during the service, or uh, we also have the tidely application. And we just are so thankful that uh, the ones that are here are here. And uh, join me in prayer for a moment. Father, we just come before you and we just thank you for your goodness and your glory. We thank you, Lord, and we ask for your protection for ourselves, for our families, and for everyone in our nation and in the world against uh, this pandemic that has been declared. Lord, we ask for your healing for people who are afflicted. We ask for your protection for those to, to prevent infection. Lord, we just love you. We just want everything to be in your glory and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, normally, we like to start out with uh, praise and prayer requests. If anybody has anything specific they want to mention, uh, anything that's specific on our heart that we can pray uh, as a group before we get started. Okay, we're still left up, Melissa and Brian. In their recovery. Anybody else? Uh, something? Like yes, Michael. Yep. <laughs> good. That's a that's a praise report here. Puppy's doing good, and your wife and uh, son are here too, so that's good. Yes, Ernestine. Oh. Wow. Okay. Praise God. So Ernestine fell down, but the, she had a good doctor's report. No, no big injuries. Oh, yes. Don't worry. Oh, I just want to praise God that Quentin back. Okay, good. Yeah, good to see Quentin this morning. All right, Quentin, you have anything to add before we get started? No. All righty, good. Oh. No, I meant, do you have any prayer requests or anything? Well, I want to pray that I'm going to get back to work. Okay, good. Very soon. Okay, good. Well, let's go we ahead and get started. I want to praise then. that God is in charge. Well, that's and he, right. He's got it all that's covered. Right. That's right. All right, well, let's pray. Let's get started here. Lord God, we thank you that you are with us. Uh, you are the God of angel armies, like we're going to sing, God. Uh, nothing is a surprise to you. You never leave us nor forsake us, God. And and you are preparing us to be with you forever in your glory, God, and, and uh, preparing our hearts to be uh, 
more like your son, Jesus Christ, God. We, we do lift up all those people who are, as Brian said earlier, uh, uh, affected by the coronavirus. We pray for anybody, mostly people who are feeling isolated right now and lonely and fearful, God. We, we lift them up, God, and uh, we just pray for uh, recovery and, and healing. We lift up Melissa and Brian, God. We pray for, we give you thanks that she's doing well and we continue uh, praise for her, her healing. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that Ernestine had a good doctor's report and that she's doing good. And uh, we uh, thank you that Quentin is here. And, and if I left out anybody else, uh, we just know that you hear all things, you know all things, and you're worthy of all praise. And we will sing your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One, two, three, and... promise we can keep. Amen. Let's go ahead and greet one another. Say hello to your neighbor. Tell them how God has blessed you this morning. Hi. Hi. Good morning.
pieces broken and scattered and mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing grace how sweet the sound that says Oh, yeah. 
Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for the joy that we have for what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Hey, welcome, Facebook. Yes. Who do we got watching from Facebook, Kristen? Some local people. Maybe we'll have our friends from the Philippines or India. It's really cool. You know, it's, the virus isn't all bad. You know, you get sick. Some of you, this is like. What's up, brother? Hey, Facebook! <laughs> Come as you are. Some of you are in your PJs eating pancakes, watching the service. That's awesome. We encourage people to do that. Uh, one of the things we're going to learn, and uh, something the Bible teaches us, and sometimes something like this has to tell us, church is not an event, it's not a building. Just because you came to church doesn't make you more of a Christian than someone that's in your PJs eating pancakes, watching the service. Amen. Right? So, amen. Be safe. Some of you are going, hey, be, you know, this is all just a media thing. Hey, you know what? We're, this is the way I'm taking it. I'm not speaking for all the leaders, but I'm taking it as I want to love my neighbors and my Christian family well. And so I'm not going to shake your hand. I'm not, I'm not going to because I love you. I, I, love to, I love to hug. I love to handshake. But I love you. I'm not going to do it because I don't know if I have the virus. You, did you know that? You don't know if you have the virus. It's like, it's just like the flu. Just, just listen to the authorities, okay? Just some of you, it's going to be a stretch. You're going to be going, okay, I just need to listen to people and not be so headstrong in things. Let's have fun with this, right? Now, now those who are those who have the virus and those who are dying, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're going to be praying for them. But man, there's kids out of school for six weeks. All right, let's make the best of this. Parents are going, oh, please let them go back to school. Um, some, some of the youth, if you want to, let's load up the van and not, you know, six feet distance, but let's get some kids in the van and let's go on some hikes. Yesterday, we went down to the Seattle waterfront. Nobody was down there. It was awesome. And just walking around, seeing God's great beauty. Uh, but uh, some of you are working from home now, and it can be good. You can work in your PJs, and you can, but sometimes that could be distracting, working at home. It's like, man, I'm not getting as much done. So, well, all that to say is welcome wherever you are. If you're here, if you're in your living room, uh, that let's let's just see what God has to do. God is good. He doesn't he doesn't stop being good through all this, right? And we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for those with the coronavirus. We're gonna pray for those with uh, uh, 
any other kinds of diseases, we're going to be praying for our persecuted church uh, friends, and let's just do that before we get started. God, I thank you so much that you are good, and you are great, and you never stop being great, and you're faithful, and God, we're going to keep our eyes on you, not on a virus, not on what's, uh, what's going wrong in this world. We want to be vigilant. We want to, we want to care for people well. But God, thank you that we don't have to fear anything because we keep our eyes on you. You're greater than anything. And God, I pray that you help us see this as an opportunity, God, to, to reach people for you. God, that this, is a, this is a time for us to, to do some things we've never done before. Thank you that we can stream our services worldwide. Thank you for all the churches that can do that now. God, we pray for our, our friends in the persecuted countries. God, that you would keep them uh, strong in you. Keep them faithful to the very end. God, may we learn from our persecuted brothers and sisters of what it means to have, be sold out for Jesus. God, I thank you for this morning where we get to get in your word. I thank you for, even though I don't like country music, I really liked that last song, God. I just thank you. I thank you that we get to sing. I thank you for music that you gave us. God, even though school's not going on right now, thanks for bringing Robin here with us so she can uh, lead worship with us. So God, we, we look at the things that you're also providing. And God, you, you are awesome. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, we are in a series on the cross. And this isn't the, this isn't the first week we did Facebook Live because I, I love this. Uh, I was gone at a Mexico missions retreat on the Oregon coast. I know it's not in Mexico, but we are getting ready for our Mexico mission trip that hopefully will happen uh, if God uh, wills it. Uh, happened in June, but Vince preached and started our series on the cross of Christ, talking about how Jesus died on the cross to, to uh, remove our debt, to, to get rid of our debt, right? To pay our debt uh, that we owe to God because we cannot fulfill the law. And so he preached, but then he also had his Facebook on Facebook Live. So I'm, I'm on the Oregon coast, and I'm just checking Facebook, and I'm going, Man, I can watch some of the service. I, that was so cool. So let's, let's take advantage of that. If you, if you do get on Facebook, if you're not here next week or some other weeks, share it. If you're on Facebook with us, share that with other people. Say, hey, come on and watch this. We're going to get into the Word together. Uh, so that's what we're doing today is our second sermon on the cross, what Jesus did at the cross. Uh, so this second one is Jesus died to rescue you from Satan. Is that awesome? He, he, he died to rescue you from Satan. And I'm going to read a passage here, and I'm going to try not to go two hours because, and please don't click off on Facebook, uh, but I'm just saying that because there's so much to say in this. There's so much to say because we don't even, most of Americans don't even believe there's a Satan. Don't even believe there's demons. So, one, I got to convince you that there is a Satan and demons, and then why we uh, need to care about that, and then what Jesus did to send them to hell. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. So, Colossians chapter 2, we're going to look at one verse, but let me give you context. Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 6, says, Therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. So as you became Christians, Paul's saying keep going. Keep being rooted. Be like a flourishing tree. Don't wither. Don't go away from Christ. Stick in with Christ. See to it that no one takes you captive. That's important because we're going to look at that, an idea of being captive later on in our passage. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. What Paul's concerned with is that they would listen to other belief systems that don't include Christ. That is a lot of our world. That's a lot of what we try to teach uh, our kids, ourselves, is Christ has to be in the very middle of everything. So we sent, uh, I, I know Different kinds of schools are for different kinds of kids. We've tried them, we've tried them all, except for homeschooling. My wife refused to do homeschooling. 
But uh, we've done private school, public school, uh, trade uh, type school at PSSC. We've done some different things. And you know what? They're all good. We found it's just for different times with our kids. It's been really good. But one of the things I wanted to start off, and we, you know, our first kid, we're going, I've never done, I, I never had kids before. I never went to private school. But I just, here's what I wanted for our kids when they started at uh, Christian school. And this isn't, doesn't mean you have to do Christian school. It's just think about how we teach our kids, what we teach our kids. The reason isn't because they're going to be away from all evil and it's going to be a little holy huddle. It's like, man, there's problems at Christian school. Do you know there's sinners at Christian school? Just like there's sinners right here in this room. There's a sinner up on the stage. But there's sinners at Christian school. But here's what, here's what I wanted. I wanted a teacher who would teach math as something that God created. The history was all about God. That recess, all about God. That when there's problems at school, hey, we're going to pray. Wait, and, and that's what happened. I never went to a Christian school. This is really cool. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, anybody else from Seattle Christian, we got Kara Kogel here, and I, lo- I got to sub for her once she did this PE teacher. It's like, that is so fun sometimes. <laughs> Subbing for P.E., it's a little scary sometimes. But, uh, but P.E. can be about God. And it's, it's like, how, how do you teach that God has everything to do with everything? Paul's going, there are teachings out there that will, they're going to leave Jesus out of everything. Okay? They're going to they're gonna not teach you about Jesus at all. And he says, it's according to the elemental spirits of the world. I think what he's saying there is it's demonic. He's talking about these elemental spirits, because if you look at context, he's talking a lot about demons and spiritual beings. He says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That is a huge verse. He's saying Jesus is God in the flesh, that, that God came to earth as a baby in Jesus, and he's the God-man. He never stopped being God, but he became man. And then verse 10 talks about you. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So who are we? We're filled with Jesus. You have the presence of Jesus. Everywhere you go, you have the presence of Jesus. Right? When you go to the store looking for toilet paper, remember Jesus is in you. Do not hit someone or take someone else's toilet paper. All right? Do, be kind. Be kind. It's like, hey, you need my toilet paper? Here, you can have my toilet paper. Uh, but, but everywhere you go, you're on mission. Everywhere you go, you're bringing the presence of Jesus, and he's the head of every single authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He's, he's saying that you have a new nature now. You have this nature of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you have also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. I love this. Your identity is you are not alive to sin anymore. You are dead to sin. You're alive to Jesus Christ. And when you were buried in the waters, you were, you were showing that, Jesus Christ put away that old self of yours, and he gave you a new nature. You who were dead in your trespasses and circumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Every single trespass, every single sin has been forgiven. And uh, that's what what, uh, Vince really keyed in on last week, is that debt that we owed. That sin, debt that we owe, it is eternal. It's huge. You cannot pay your debt to God. You can't do it. That's why Jesus came on the cross, to pay our debt. And here's what he did. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed. This is the verse we're going to key in on. I just wanted to get the context. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Who are those rulers and authorities? Demons, Satan and demons, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So let's back up. Who is Satan and who are demons? They're angels. Okay, they were created by God. They're spiritual beings. 
In Colossians 1.16, Paul says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, the things you don't see he created, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. I guess that's all angelic beings. He created those. All things were created through him and for him. So Jesus is the creator of all things, and he is what all creation is about. It's created by him and for him. That means everything is for his glory. Everything, Mount Rainier, is shouting out the glory of Jesus and saying, he is so great. He, the galaxies, the Betelgeist or Betelgeuse, however you want to say that, the big, huge star that we don't know if it's collapsing or ending or what, um, that is just putting on a show for us and saying, God is awesome. Jesus is awesome. And he's what all of creation is about. Angels were created by God, and they were meant to give all glory to God. He, uh, so he created angels good. So I, I want to back up. Angels aren't people who die, right? So sometimes we'll say, well, he's, he's got his wings. Well, I don't know if we get wings when we die or not. We're not told that. You know, we see the, uh, what a wonderful, it's a wonderful life, and, and maybe when we die, we get wings. Well, you know, we're, we're not told that. But angels are different beings than humans, okay? So Satan and a number of angels, here's what's very important. They were angels that were created good, but they sinned against God. Second Peter 2, 4. So I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures out, so if you want to write them down, you can. They won't be up on the screen. Next week, we'll work on that. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, it talks about they sinned against God. Jude 6, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until judgment of the great day. So these angels didn't stay where they were supposed to stay in authority. They, didn't, they weren't under the authority of God. And what we see is, is probably pride is most likely what got them kicked out of heaven, is they wanted to not worship God, but to be God. That I, I want to have that power, and I want to have that authority. Does that sound familiar? That's what we do. That's what sin is. Sin is, I don't want to live under that authority. I want to be the authority. I've got a better way than God does. Um, so Satan and demons are, they're real, they're evil, they're fallen angels who once were good, but many people in the Western world don't even believe they're real. Some of you might not even believe, you might still be going, convince me, you got to convince me. Uh, there's a Barna poll. This was a while ago, so I would imagine it's even worse than this. But four out of ten Christians strongly agreed that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. So that's 40% of Christians, not of all people, but of all Christians, don't even believe that Satan's a real living being. Uh, an additional 2 out of 10 Christians, so, so this would bring it up to about 60%, so 20%, 20 more percent, would, would agree somewhat uh, with that perspective. So a minority of Christians indicate that they believe Satan is real, by disagreeing with the statement. If you believe that, that, that Satan and demons are li real living beings, you're in the minority within Christianity, people who call themselves Christians. That's why this is so important. C.S. Lewis said uh, that there are equal and opposite errors about Satan and demons. One error is to disbelieve they even exist. The other is to believe and feel excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So it's, it's like either not believe, and, and you would imagine Satan would be okay with either of those, right? Either create fear in us or no fear. It's like there's no Satan, and live our lives like there is no Satan or demons. But the Bible speaks clearly about them as well as angels. They can affect a Christian, so it's wise to understand who and what they are. Satan and demons sinned and lost their privilege of serving God. They continually work evil in the world. Satan is the head of demons. Uh, it said in Matthew 25, talks about the devil and his angels. So it seems like he's the, the, the top of that hierarchy in, angel, in, in demons. Uh, that word Satan means adversary. He's, he's the opponent. He's the one blocking your way. He, he doesn't want you to get to God. Another name for him is devil. It's, he's the accuser or slanderer. He's also called the serpent, Beelzebul. 
ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and many times he's just called the evil one. Second, second point. Let's, so that's who he is. What do they do? What does Satan and demons do? He, he's the originator of sin. So Satan sinned before humans did, and, and then he tempted Adam and Eve. Um, the, there's, uh, oh, and I forgot to tell you about, we talked about Satan, who's also called the devil. Those demons, here's some different descriptions of who they are. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Does that give you the little shudders when you hear things like that? Now, understand, uh, in this room or around us, and, and angels aren't confined to a roof or they're, they're, they're not, they don't have spatial qualities, they're spiritual. And so you would have to think that there's angels just, I love a picture, there's a picture I absolutely love. It's a pastor preaching and he's got a couple angels on his side, just to, to his left and his right, just, just with him as he's preaching. Or you might have seen uh, the painting of a child in his bed, and there's an angel with a sword guarding, guarding that child. That's more real than we even know, I would imagine, just that, that they are ministering spirits. They're guarding us. They're watching over us. But along with those good angels, there's demonic principalities that hate your guts, and they hate God, they hate everything about God, and they want to take God down, they want to take you down, and they're after you. But as we see today, what I want you to see today is don't be afraid of them, unless you're sided with them, but don't be afraid of them, because God's way bigger. God is, he, he's the one who created all things, right? So, so what do they do? Uh, John eight forty four. Jesus said, he's speaking to Jewish leaders that want to kill him, how, how would you like that? Speak, he's speaking to people that, that are out to kill him. And he says, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do the father's desire, your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what he says about Satan. Uh, they want to defeat God's plan and purpose. So you look back in, in Genesis 3, third chapter in the Bible, they're corrupting mankind already uh, in the history of the world. M Matthew chapter 2, we get into the New Testament, he's trying to kill Jesus. Satan's trying to kill Jesus as a baby. Who is he working through? Herod, right? Herod wanted to kill every baby under two years old to try to get rid of Jesus. Little did Herod know who his accomplice was, or who the puppeteer was in this, that, that Satan was behind this. Think about what, I mean, I think about the virus, the coronavirus. I don't know Satan's involvement in this, but I don't pretend to know either that he does or isn't, but he wants, he wants you to fear. He wants you to, he, he has worked with diseases, right? It's not out of his capabilities, uh, he, he, he does all kinds of things, division, and God, here's the cool thing we're going to see today is God makes awesome things happen through terrible circumstances. He makes incredible victories through things that look like defeat. Matthew chapter 4, Satan tempted Jesus to, help, to try to get him to abandon his mission. He gets baptized. How many of you, you got baptized, it was a glorious day, and then, man, the devil attacked you right away. That's what happened to Jesus. He got baptized, not like, not like he had sin to wash away or anything, but he's starting his ministry. This is exciting. 40 days out in the wilderness, fasting and praying, thinking about Scripture, and Satan is attacking him and attacking him and attacking him, trying to get him to fall away from his mission. John 13, 2 talks about how Satan put it in Judas's heart to betray Jesus and have him killed. But here's a problem for, for Satan. We want to go right to that now, don't we? I want to know the problem for Satan. I don't want to know what, good, what, what stuff that he's doing that he's proud of. The problem for Satan is that Jesus' death was Satan's defeat. It was his defeat. I want to look at this again with you. Uh, look at Colossians 2, 14 and 15. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. You're not guilty you, what if you had this bill, it was like, uh, and you might have this, $100,000 in debt, not talking about your home, 
because it's more than that probably, but $100,000 in debt, and you owe this, and guess what? You, you need to pay it now. And you're going, I, there's, not, there's no point. I can't do it. Let me, you know, back in the day, they used to become slaves to the people they owed money to. Okay, back in Jesus' day. Uh, so it, it's just like this. Is, your debt to God is way bigger than a $100,000 debt. He forgave you that. Have you ever been forgiven a debt? You go, whew, what a relief. What a weight that was taken off of me. Let me tell you that the weight of sin that was taken off, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. When he was nailed to the cross, your sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus. He took your sin. And when you try to take your sin back, you're, you're looking at Jesus on the cross going, ah, give that back to me. That belongs to me. And he's saying, this is the reason I'm going through this whole torturous thing is because I'm freeing you from sin. I'm freeing you from this debt that you have. And then, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So, since he failed at stopping God's plan of salvation, Jesus was born, he went to the cross, he rose again. Does he stop? No, he's after you now. You, okay, that didn't work. I'm after his kids. I'm after people who want to who give themselves to Jesus. So he's after individuals. 1 Peter 5.8 says that we are to be sober-minded, uh, be watchful, be alert, wake up is what he's saying. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But here, here's a cool thing. He's not, Satan's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at all times. Je God can do that. God is everywhere all the time. Satan can't. He, he's at one place at one time. So, so he's probably really busy with world leaders and some really big celebrities. But there are all kinds of demons that are after us, right? There's all kinds of demons. So Satan can't read our minds, I don't think. He probably sees tendencies of what people are like, but he doesn't know all things like God does. So he's not an equal opposite force like God. Uh, just as Satan tempted Eve to sin and tried to tempt Jesus to sin, he and demons use all kind of tactics, tactics to turn people from God and devour them. He uses lies to keep you from believing the truth. He lied to Eve in the garden, questioning who God was and what he said. Remember what he said to Eve? He says, um, you know, you, you really can't eat of any of the trees in the garden. And that's not what God said. He said, there's one tree. You can have everything. Eat of everything. Just don't eat that one. And Satan, he's lying to them. He's saying, he, he, he's basically saying to Eve, God's not good. And he says the same thing to you today. If, you can if, if the devil can get you to doubt God's goodness, you're going to look somewhere else for goodness. You're going to look to a girlfriend or a boyfriend for goodness. You're going to look to a habit for goodness. You're going to look to this life here as goodness. You're going to look to the eradication of coronavirus or a, 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 um, immunization for that. You're going to look at that as that's the best thing that's ever happened. And it's not. God's the best thing that's ever happened. He is the ultimate good. And if we don't have our eyes on him, we have eyes on other things that will not save us. And they don't care for us. They don't love you. They, it's like, my boyfriend loves me. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, he loves you in a certain way, right? God loves you regardless. You, we are so sinful. <laughs> we are so sinful. And God says, I love you. I absolutely adore you. And the more we understand our sin, the more we're going, we just shake our heads going, <laughs> you're good. You are so good. But then he also gets them to doubt. He gets Eve to doubt his faithfulness. You're not going to die. That's what he says. He's, you're not going to die. If we doubt his faithfulness, we're not going to trust God in anything. If we don't, if we don't understand that he's always going to come through, he's all, everything he says in his word, it's true. And he doesn't hold back on his promises. He's going to perform what he says he's going to do. Uh, Satan and demons are limited, though, in, by God's control. They can't do every, anything they want to. They have to get permission. God, and, and, and that's what confuses us sometimes. It's like, God, imagine being Job. 
You gave him permission to do what? And then he wasn't even, I mean, we got to see what happened to Job. Job didn't get to see why, what was going on in the heavenlies. But we look back on the story of Job, and Satan's asking God, can I, uh, can I do some things to Job? And God's going, okay. And I'm looking at that story going, is that what happens? Is that what happens to me? Is that what happens to other people? Never, ever, ever doubt God's goodness and his faithfulness and his greatness. Never doubt those things. Because was God good in the story of Job? Yeah, he absolutely was. He didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. So now uh, looking at just a couple uh, points I want to get from Colossians 3.15. One, Jesus disarmed Satan and demons at the cross. Jesus disarmed Satan and demons at the cross. Picture Jesus on the cross. Maybe close your eyes. Picture him on the cross. That doesn't look powerful, does it? He dies being mocked. He dies a criminal's death in shame, intense torture, naked, and he looks helpless. Yet, this is the place of the greatest victory in the world. Jesus fought at the cross and won at the cross. Paul says rulers and authorities were disarmed at the cross. Satan had tempted Adam and Eve to rebel against God and enslaved mankind into sin. And right from the get-go, God promised a, a, a gospel. He promised good news. Genesis 3.15, he said to Satan, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So God's promising there's a Savior that's going to come. He's going to be born to a woman, and he's going to crush your head. You're going you're to nip at his heel. You're going to wound him, but he's going to put the fatal blow into you, Satan. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. He was born of a woman, just like God promised. Satan tried to kill him. He worked with Herod to dis- try to destroy him, but he, he didn't get destroyed. He announced, when he was in his ministry, he announced that he had been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. He wanted freedom. Freedom from what? From sin, from Satan, from hell, from yourself. Did you know that you're you're one of your own worst enemies? It's like, we don't make great decisions for ourselves, right? But but he, he saved us from all that. Satan used people throughout Jesus' history to try to kill him. Did you, have you noticed that where you're reading the Gospels and you go, and they tried to find him, but he escaped. It's like, I don't know if he was using the, the God powers then. So he's like, it was invisible, or if he just snuck through, or, uh, or God blinded their eyes so they couldn't see him. But he never died until it was time. He, he couldn't be killed until it was time. And when it was his time, here's what he did. He rode into Jerusalem. It's time. I'm riding into Jerusalem. He rode in on a colt, which would be a very humble way to come as king. He's coming in on Passover week. This is the week where God says, I forgive your sins. I'm rescuing. I redeemed you. The blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And Jesus is coming in as the Passover lamb. He's coming in as the conquering king. He doesn't look like a conquering king, but he is. The battle was fought at the cross. While he was on the cross, the soldiers were casting lots to divide up his clothes. Can you imagine that? The king of kings, lord of lords, the creator of the universe, up on a cross in shame, and they're, they're casting lots for his clothes. But while Jesus looked like he was being defeated, as he was crucified in open shame, uh, what was really going on was Jesus was disarming Satan. What Satan meant for evil, God meant for the salvation of the world. And I, this is how I picture it, is Jesus gives a big old kick to the hand, kicks that sword out of Satan's hand, and disarms Satan, and he's like, oh, no. It's like, that's what he did at the cross. He defeated Satan at the cross. He disarmed Satan at the cross. His head was crushed. Satan had nothing left to attack us with. Satan's going to attack you. He's going to attack you. We're going to see that in Ephesians. He's going to attack you, but his sword was taken away. He, he can only do so much damage. Jesus gave back what Satan had taken from us. Life, Satan had taken that from you. Joy, Satan takes that from us. Peace, Satan took that from us. Freedom, he gives you freedom. He, Satan enslaved you. By you becoming sinners. Satan has a, had his authority stripped. 
So don't fear Satan. Why? He's defeated. Don't fear him. Romans, I, I need you to hear this word because this is, this is too good. Romans 8. I, I need to memorize. I keep saying I need to memorize this. Now I said it on the internet. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> Romans 8. I need to memorize this. I need to memorize. Someone hold me accountable. Um, starting with verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Satan? Nope, it's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Satan? Nope, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who at the right, is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's praying for you right now. He's for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he goes on, he's like, nothing's going to separate you from the love of Christ. Christian, don't walk around. Don't walk around like this. Don't walk around with your head down, defeated, because the, your enemy, your old enemy, is, he doesn't have power over you anymore. He's not your authority. He's not your boss anymore. When you do this, it's like you're still enslaved to him. Christian, lift your head up, not in pride, but in victory. You don't have to say yes to sin anymore. You don't have to walk around going, oh, I'm just a sinner. I keep giving into the same old thing. I'm addicted to this. I, I have to do this. It's like, no. Tell Satan to go to hell. Because that's where he's going. He has no power over you anymore. If you're in Christ, he has no authority. He can't, he can't put you on the stand. He can't try you anymore. You've been tried. You were released at the cross. Satan was beaten at the cross. Second, Jesus triumphed over S Satan at the cross, putting him to open shame. I love this. I love this. Now think about this. In the Roman day, uh, there they would have parades, these victory parades. And there would be a general that would be in the middle of this, uh, middle of this parade, and he'd be on a chariot, and with these fine horses out leading in this parade, behind him would be chained up these kings and leaders, these prisoners of war. Here's my spoil. Here's, here's who we conquered. One, to show how great the Roman army was, but also to shame those who were the foes. Paul is saying that's what Jesus did on the cross. He put Satan and demons to open shame by chaining them up as prisoners and parading them around as defeated foes. Jesus on the cross looks defeated. He's bleeding. He was held captive to the cross by nails. He's suffocating, crying out in extreme pain. But this was for the ultimate triumph of our, against our enemies. He has forgiven our sins. For those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Christ takes your sin and that condemned you to death and gave you his righteousness for eternal life with God. I want to ask you something. On Facebook in your living room, eating your pancakes, here in this room, are you in Christ? Do you belong to Jesus? Because if you don't, there's only two kingdoms. The Bible only gives two choices. You're in the kingdom of God by choice. You're in the kingdom of God because you said yes to Jesus. That means... He's your Savior. He's your Lord. He calls the shots now, which is way better. Man, any Christian here would tell you it's way better than calling my own shots because I don't do a good job in that. He's such a good Lord, and he's my creator, and he gives me life and peace and freedom. There's that kingdom or there's Satan's kingdom. And we already talked about how much authority Satan has now. We, we didn't talk too much about his, his uh, demise, but he's going to be tortured in a lake of fire forever. That's where it's going. Re Revelation chapter 20, you can see that. That's where he's going. Do you want to be in that kingdom? Because in that kingdom, not even he is Lord. They're, everyone's their own Lord, and it's horrible forever. Or do you want to be in the kingdom of light? I, I just want to put it that point blank. It's like, I'll take the third kingdom. There isn't a third kingdom. There isn't middle ground. There is, I'm kind of for Jesus. There's, are you all in for Jesus? And if you don't know, that's okay. Check him out. Ask questions. Get in the word. But it's not okay just to go, I'll just find out in the end. I mean, it's, you can do that.
But man, that, I wouldn't suggest that. I wouldn't suggest that because ev when he comes again, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So today, Jesus isn't helpless on the cross. He rose again and ascended to his rightful place in glory. Lastly, I want to talk about Chris. Okay, what about now? He defeated them. It doesn't look like Satan went away. <laughs> I wish he was in hell now, uh, but he's roaming. He's, he's got a lot of freedom, doesn't he? And the demons have a lot of freedom. So let's talk about Christians and spiritual warfare. Why doesn't God wipe Satan out? He will. He will be thrown into eternal lake of fire. Until then, James 4, 7 says, resist. If you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Christian, you have the authority of Jesus to tell demons to leave. Ephesians 4, 27, you are to give no opportunity to the devil. Don't give him opportunity in your life. Here's how we do that. We open ourselves up to sin. We say, I'll just, this just once, it's just one thing, it's just this time, I just can't help it, I'm human. And we open up our lives to all kinds of things. Sometimes it's like we wonder why we're so depressed, and then we look at what we're opening up in our, our lives to, and we go, no wonder you're depressed. Or we go, man, I'm so anxious. And then we look at what we're inviting into our lives, into our minds, and we go, no wonder you're anxious. Start there. Start with what you're putting in your mind. Start with what you're opening yourselves up to. Don't give him an opportunity. You need to quarantine yourself from the sin virus. Okay, you need to go, that's not what I want. I don't want to give it to anybody else. I'm staying over here. I'm going to stay as far away from sin as possible. If you go, that's sin, don't see how, have you been here before? It's like, you see how close you can get? and still call yourself a Christian? It's like, that's, re that's ridiculous. That's, that's stupid. It's like, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I can still do this. I can still do Or you can look at it this way. I'm a Christian, and I hate that because God hates that. I'm a Christian, and I don't trust myself. Uh, I trust God, and I need him. And this is a weak moment right now, and so I'm not going to be in this predicament. I'm going to get myself out of here. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. How are we doing on? All right. Maybe grab another pancake. Just a couple more scriptures. Ephesians chapter 6. This is so, so good. Um, Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. So be strong in God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Those are demons. Satan and demons. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand with, uh, to, to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. That's a lot of praying, he's saying right there in that verse. He's saying, you need to be praying all the time with all kinds of prayers for every single person. Okay, so that's, that's praying continually. That's what that is. And also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So part of the, part of the armor is the sword of the Spirit. Man, we got to get into this. I, I hope, I pray that you love God's Word. I hope it's not just, oh, I'm convicted, I need to read God's Word. It might start there. It might start with, okay, I need to have devotions. And then, but as you spend time with it, you go, oh, this is God speaking to me. This is the very Word of God speaking to me. He loves me that much. And He has a message for me today, every day. He has, every morning, every night, whenever you... Open his word. I hope you love God's word because he's going to tell you all kinds of truths 
And that is one of the greatest weapons against the devil's lies and accusations against you. He's going to say something, and you go, no condemnation. He's going to say something, and he's like, I'm free. What are you, what are you bringing that up for? Uh, someone once says, like, if the devil ever reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future, right? It's like, oh, yeah? You're going to hell, so, ah, all right. You're uh, open shame. That's open shame for Satan. Uh, prayer, the word, remembering the truth about what God says about himself and you. Remember, Satan and demons are defeated at the cross. Here's the last thing I want to read to you. It's in Revelation. It can be a scary book, but for Christians, it's meant to be comforting. It's meant to help you stand up strong. It's help, help to meant you, It's meant to uh, drive you to Jesus. When sin's hitting hard, drive you to Jesus. When persecution's hitting hard, drive to Jesus. When you get frightened about whatever, virus or anything, you need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Here's what it says, starting with verse, 11, uh, verse 7 of, of Revelation 12. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and the angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him. How? If you're following along with me, what does it say? By the blood of the Lamb. That's how, you're con that's how you conquer. You conquer Satan through the blood of the Lamb and only through the blood of the Lamb. It was his death on the cross that gave you, gave you freedom. It gave, gave you freedom from Satan. He, all, he goes on to say, and by the word of their testimony. What he's saying is not only his death on the cross, now you get to share about the death of the cross and his resurrection. You get to share the gospel. It's not just your testimony. Right? He's not saying just share your testimony. It's a good thing. But the testimony about Jesus, the truth about Jesus, what he's done. This world needs to know that there's not a reason to fear. This world needs to know that this, this life is not the end. I've heard many of you say it already. It's like, hey, if I die, I die. The world's looking at you like you're a freak. It's like, when you're dead, it's over. And, and not according to God. When, when we're dead, it's just beginning. Don't speed yourself along there, but just enjoy this life. Tell people about Jesus. But when you die, it's not the end. It's just beginning. It gets way better after this lifetime. So, so you defeat him. You have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. And they loved not their lives even unto death. They're saying, this world's not my home. You know, if I die, I die. It, it, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. Do you trust Jesus? Or do you trust the thief? Because that's what Satan is. He's, Satan's a thief. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. He came to give you life. Will you say yes to Jesus? If you've said yes to Jesus, will you remember that you've conquered, Jesus has conquered your enemy? Don't, don't give in to him. When we take communion, what we're doing is we're remembering the victory we have in Jesus, that we have, a, we have a Savior, we have a Lord. His name's Jesus. We're gonna, we're gonna take communion, and it's in sanitary cups. If you're at home, I encourage you to take whatever you have, pray with your family, but spend some time just being grateful. It's like, Jesus, thank you for freeing me from Satan, from, from his clutches, from, from being uh, an enemy of yours, God. We're not enemies of, of God's anymore. We're friends with God. So you can take this, and what it'll have is there's a top film 
that you, you peel back and there's a there's a, a piece of bread there, cracker there. You peel back the second one and it's the juice. And so we the reason we're doing this is we love you. We care about you. The government didn't say, thou shalt uh, do this. It's saying, hey, just, just be kind and not pass this on to other people. So let's thank God for the freedom that we have in Jesus. And then after that, we're going to go right into some, uh, some more worship and song. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you're not against us. You're for us, that you want life for us. God, I, think, I just pray that we would believe that we're forgiven. God, that we would uh, not believe the lies of the evil one anymore, that we wouldn't believe that we're junk and that, that we're just that same old thing we used to be. God, that if we're in you, there's no condemnation. There's no one to condemn us anymore. You justify us. God, I pray that we would believe your truths. I pray that we would preach those truths to ourselves and to other people. God, we love you. And we just celebrate the freedom we have in you. Thank you for the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand as we worship the Lord. Trouble won't throw me, won't break me, won't scare me no more. Fear must have thought I was faithless when it came for my heart. 
Cause I got a song that will never die And I know your love is the reason why And I'll sing the night into the morning And I'll sing the fear into your praise I'll sing my song into your presence Whenever I say your name Jesus, let the devil know not today Tell me, did the enemy panic as he took up that cross? Tell me, did the darkness cry mercy as he rolled back that rock? Cause I know your life is the life in mine And I know your love is the reason why And I'll sing the Never I say your name Jesus, the devil know not today Not now, not ever again Your love stood down death Crushed the devil's head Fear is just a liar running out of breath The fight beneath your feet Now I'm standing on Jesus Name. So let the devil know not today. Let the devil know not today. No, no, not now, not ever again. Let the devil know not today, not today, not today. And I'll sing the night into the morning, and I'll sing the fear into your breath. Let the devil know not today. Let the devil know not today. No, no, not now, not ever again. Let the devil know not today. Let the devil know not today. Let the devil know not today. Amen. There's a war going on for my soul And a beast seeking to devour me This I know and I keep looking back Just to see how close he's getting I'm forgetting who I am and where I'm going uh -huh. Cause your cross it has won the war Your death it has paid it all your blood it has washed me clean, given me the victory, your life you laid down to save me from the grave, you rose again, the enemy may come for me, but I know that my life is in your hands. There's a war going on for my soul. And a thief bent on stealing all my peace and all my joy He won't rest until he robs me of my faith And destroys me for he knows his time is short I forget he is defeated cause your cross He has won the war, your death 
It has paid it all your blood. It has washed me clean, given me the victory your life. You laid down to save me from the grave. You rose again. The enemy may come for me, but I know that my life is in your hands. Lord, when I forget, put your merciful hand on me like you did to John. Tell me to fear not, for you're the first and the last of one who is, was, and is to come. And like in Deuteronomy 1, like a father cares a son, Lord, I know that you carry me. And the work you began, because you're faithful and just, you will complete in me until the day of Christ Jesus, your cross. It has won the war, your death. It has paid it all your blood. It has washed me clean, given me the victory your life. You laid down to save me from the grave. You rose again. The enemy may come for me, but I know that my life is in your hands. Amen. Testify, come on. You believe it, you receive it, you can feel it. Somebody testify. You believe it, you receive it, you can feel it. Somebody testify. You believe it, if you receive it. You can feel it. Somebody testify. Oh, 
making a decision for Jesus, or maybe you're rededicating your life, I'd love to pray with you up here by the cross. Or if you just need prayer, uh, not just prayer, if you want prayer, we'd love to pray with you up here. On your way out, if you want to put these cards, uh, just let us know, prayer requests, praises, any decisions, and then offerings and tithes can go in those baskets in the back, or you can give online. Uh, There's a Tithely app you can use for that. Uh, Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much for life in you. Thank you for the joy that you give us. God, thank you for family. Thank you for uh, the brothers and sisters we have in Christ. I, I pray, God, that during these days that you will help us to find ways to, to remain uh, interactive with each other. God, that we wouldn't feel alone, that we wouldn't feel isolated. God, we pray uh, that you would help eradicate uh, this virus, that you would help us to find a a cure for that or an immunization for it. Uh, God, thank you that nothing is too hard for you. I pray for those that, uh, that are making hard decisions in our government. God, we pray for them to make wise decisions. God, we pray for those who are ill, those who this is really attacking. God, would you please just be their peace and help them to know who you are. Uh, God, help us to be on mission for you. Uh, God, help us as we go from this place to continue to walk with your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.